Good morning. I hope you're ready to worship and hear what God has to say to all of us today. My name's Cassandra and I'm the children's ministry coordinator here. Children are welcome to go with me to our kids zone after our opening worship songs. And we wanna extend a warm welcome to all of you who are here or watching on, uh, online later today. Can I remind you all to fill out your connection card and drop it with your offering in the boxes by the doors as you leave. We are so blessed by all of you. Your weekly giving to First Presbyterian helps us to share God's message of hope and love with our community. Let's Thrive in 25 is our theme for 2025. As we build up this month to our Commitment Sunday on the 24th, we encourage you to pray about your financial support for the work of God here at First Presbyterian. With your generous giving, we can make a difference in the lives of so many people. Each of us has been blessed by God and he calls us to give so that we can grow his kingdom. We want 2025 to be an amazing year in FPC. So let's thrive in 2025. Now it's time to focus on our screens as we play our opening video before Keith, Cheryl, and Caitlin lead us in our time of worship. Let's stand. There's only Caitlin and I today. Cheryl was phoned in uh, sick. So uh, I think there's a few uh, suffering. I maybe forgot to change their clocks as well. But well done to you for making it here on time. So we all feel refreshed having an extra hour in bed, don't we? No. All right. Let's worship.
church awakens, we believe the change is coming. Holy Spirit, let us see it. When you speak, scattered darkness, light arrives in heaven open. Holy Spirit, let us hear it. When you speak, the church awakens. I think we, we can go through life and we can sometimes forget the power that we have as Christians. There's power in Jesus' name. His name is power. His name makes a difference. And he's the same God of the Bible, of the scriptures that we, we read, and the stories that we read. He's the same God today, and he's doing the same things. This is the same God.
seated. Any of the children want to go with Cassandra? That would be wonderful for a bit of fun up in Kid Zone and some great teaching. Let's just bow our heads uh, and let's pray before Caitlin reads this. Lord, we just thank you for today. We thank you that you are the same God today as you were all those years ago. Lord, help us to, to realize that you are with us, to realize that your timing is perfect, to realize that no matter what, you stand beside us. You stand with us. We thank you for blessings. And we thank you that you love each of us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today we are reading from John chapter 11, verses 32 through 44. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When Jesus had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Well, you're awake, Kate. Yeah. She gave me a wee nod there and said, we're supposed to be singing again, you know, so. Cheryl's supposed to be singing this, so if you can just imagine, all right, that, uh, I've even lost, yeah. If you can just imagine that uh, this is Cheryl's voice, because there's nothing like it, but it's going to have to do. This song's called What a Beautiful Name. Yeah. 
He didn't want dinner. And then he went to bed early, which isn't like him. He's the night owl. Lazarus is the night owl. Something wasn't right. He sent for the only one who could help, who could fix it. He'd help total strangers course. More importantly, he was our friend. I promised Lazarus. Jesus would come. He would heal him. I was sure of it. You know, you can see it sometimes in a person's eyes, that, that look. And they're letting go of this world just a little bit at a time. Those four days might as well have been four lifetimes. Everything I knew about Jesus fell apart. Not that, not that he wasn't the Messiah, it wasn't that. It was more personal. It was all this pain, all this doubt. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Our brother was dead, sealed in a tomb. And I said to him, if you had just been here, our brother wouldn't have died. But he said, didn't I tell you? If you would just believe, you would see God's glory. I knew I was supposed to embrace those four days. That gap in my life, that gap in our lives, where God made no sense at all. It was as if God wasn't even listening. But without those four days, Before I believed in him, now I believe him. We didn't understand that, but we do now. He doesn't just give life. He is life. Yes. He is the Christ. He is the Son of God who comes into this world and whoever believes in him will live let's pray Lord we just ask you you'll open our hearts our ears our minds
to the things of you. Give us the faith. Help us to trust in you. Amen. Today we're jumping into John's gospel. We've been in Mark's gospel for quite a while. But today we're jumping into this great story of the friendship and the life of Lazarus and Jesus. A real powerful video that is, isn't it? When you watch it and you, you think of the emotion that had to be there, the emotion that had to be stirred up in Martha and Mary's lives. Jesus had heard that Lazarus was ill. His good friend was gravely ill. And the first thing he did was do nothing. So unlike Jesus, so unlike Jesus to do nothing, but that just seemed to be what was happening there. Now, to be fair, I don't know exactly what I expect Jesus to do, but certainly it wasn't just to kick back and lie back and think, ah, I'll just take a break for a couple of days. His friend was gravely ill. Surely Jesus could have done something. When Lazarus needed Jesus the most, where was he? Where was he? And the disciples thought this was strange that they weren't rushing off to Lazarus' bedside. But Jesus said to them, this sickness will not end in death. It is for God's glory, so the Son of God will be glorified through it. Really, what on earth do you, do you mean, Jesus? Who wants to face the worst day of their lives and hear, this is all for God's glory? No one. And neither do I believe that Mary and Martha wanted to hear that. They wanted Jesus there in person. Sitting at the bedside of their sick bro brother who was getting weaker and weaker with every minute and every hour that passed. Where is Jesus? Where is he? He should be here by now. Where is Jesus? Lazarus is slipping away. Where is Jesus? That's just running over and over and over in their minds. And what good could he possibly do now? It's already too, too late. I don't know what changed, but after two days of doing nothing really, Jesus suddenly decides it's time to go. Let's go back to Judea, he tells the disciples. Let's go and see Lazarus and his sisters. Now, going to Judea was a really big deal. It was a dangerous place for Jesus and the disciples. The last time we were in Judea, the disciples said they tried to stone you. Every time we go there, the people get angrier. If we keep going back, death is inevitable. But what about our friend Lazarus? Jesus said. He's fallen asleep. And I have to go there and waken him up. Hang on a second, the disciples replied. I think if we're going to walk for so long and then think we're going to waken up, you're going to waken up Lazarus, you're going crazy. If he's asleep, let him sleep. Maybe not Lazarus needs to sleep to get better. But as usual, our friends, the disciples, didn't get it. Guys, Jesus said, I'm speaking metaphorically here. Jesus, Lazarus is dead. Okay, okay, oh, right. So if Lazarus is dead, surely it makes no sense for us to go where we won't be safe. What good can we do? Nothing good could come out of us all dying too. They were trying to cover their own backs. But then Thomas said something. You know, Thomas always gets a bad rap. Thomas is always doubting Thomas, doubting Thomas. That's all we ever hear, doubting Thomas. In the midst of all this here, Thomas says, fine. Now, it says he reluctantly tied his sandals, but he did say those words, fine. I guess we're going to go with you. 
so that we can all die together, is basically what he was saying. The New Testament presents us with this, with these episodes after episodes of how God's love came to different individuals. We heard last week about the healing of blind Bartimaeus and how much Jesus loved the individual. How much Jesus loves you and loves me. None of the evident barriers that we see today had any effect upon the love of God. You see, when God's love comes calling, it transcends all the barriers of social, moral, financial, and religious. Because God is God. He's above all these things. God's love has the power and the ability to see through and leap over any man-made hurdles. They're nothing in his sight. And out of all the examples and pictures of how love came calling, this scene at the death of Lazarus presents us with one of the greatest portraits of God's love and action. Just as it did with the woman at the well, the Lord of love personally showed up in great power and demonstrated his love to that woman. Once Jesus appears on the scene, love was demonstrated in such a powerful way with the resurrection of his friend, Lazarus. Nothing will remain dead, my friends, when Jesus shows up because he is life. He gives life, he is life. Maybe it's only me. But have you ever asked yourself, why did Jesus ask the people to roll away the stone from Lazarus' tomb? Why, why say, would you move that stone? Because he could have done it in an instant. He could have done it with a word. He could have done it with a movement of his hand. Jesus could have moved that stone by himself, but he asked the people to roll it away. Well, I think the answer is reasonably simple. You see, the people had the capabilities to roll the stone. They could do that. What they couldn't do was raise Lazarus from the dead. They could roll away the stone, but that's as far as they could go. And I think this is a really important and valuable lesson on how God interacts with you and me. He never asks us to do what we cannot do. And when he asks us to do something, he gives us the power through the Holy Spirit to be able to do it. And on the other hand, he will not do what we cannot do for ourselves. That's how much God loves us. He doesn't want to put us in a position that makes us feel, I'm useless. Look, we feed babies until they can take a bottle. Then we take the bottle away from them because they can now handle maybe a little spoon. It's a natural part of growing up, isn't it? Development. In our own spiritual growth, we go through the same process. When we're first saved, God just does all kinds of things in our lives that require no effort on our behalf at all. Then he starts backing off a little bit. And he allows us to encounter situations where we need to make choices or seek his word for wisdom. We actually have to think for ourselves and think what do we do. When we get into problems where we have to learn where we are responsible for the solutions to many of the problems we face. Jesus is giving us the ability to grow, to make those decisions. Look, if Jesus did everything for us, and if Jesus had done everything at the tomb of Lazarus, everybody present would just have been spectators. We can be very much like that when we come to church, we're spectators at times. 
But by them rolling away the stone, those folks participated in a miracle. They were part of a miracle. It was a small part, but it was more than those who just stood around and wondered and doubted and thought, what is this Jesus up to? Others could say they had witnessed Lazarus being raised from the dead, but the few that rolled the stone away, they could say, yes, I was there and saw it. I rolled the stone. I rolled that stone away. And in our reading, it said there was an odor, a bad odor. They're being very polite. It would have stunk. It would have been awful with the heat and the dead, dead body. Jesus was making a point. There was no doubt that Lazarus was dead. And Jesus wants us to participate and share in the miracles and the blessings that he brings, not only into our lives, but into the lives of others. He wants us to be responsible for what we can do and trust him for the things that we cannot do. The next time you get into a situation where it does not seem it's going to make any difference if we pray or not, I want you to apply the Lazarus principle and ask, where is my stone? While the situation may be completely hopeless, there's still something that God is waiting for you or for me to do. There is something to get out of the way, to be rolled away before God can do the work that he needs to do. What area of your life today do you feel and see hopelessness in? God can bring new life and light to whatever area in your life seems hopeless. Watch your stone. We all have them. Let's roll it away and watch the power of God at work and see that emptiness, that hopelessness become empty of all those things and new life breathed in. He emptied his tomb and Lazarus's as well. He'd do the same for you and for me. Mary and Martha greeted Jesus, their friend, with these words. Lord, if you could have been here, if only you could have been here, our brother would not have died. They were in bits, overcome with grief and tears. And then we see Jesus' love on display of them. When we read the words, Jesus wept. Shortest verse in scripture. The easiest one for us as Christians to remember, isn't it? Jesus wept. Two words that say everything about the relationship he had and he has with those who are friends of God. Jesus was moved to tears. You see, it's okay to grieve, to struggle, to feel loss. Jesus joins us in that grief. He shows it here in Scripture. Even at our darkest time, Jesus will weep with us. Think about it. There's incredible empathy in the simple phrase in this verse 35, Jesus wept. He knew that he could heal Lazarus. He he knew he didn't even have to come to Lazarus' tomb. He could have done it remotely. All right? He's done it many times before in miracles where he said, go home, your child is healed. He could have done that and all the grief and the pain could have been avoided. He didn't shoulder any of the blame for Lazarus' death. He knew that he was going to fix it. He knew that he was going to fix it, that Lazarus would soon rise. And that the grief that was experienced would turn to incredible joy and they would throw a party and it would be amazing. Jesus didn't try to gloss over the grief of Mary and Martha. To rush through it as if it didn't matter. He understood grief 
he entered into their grief. And in so doing, he affirmed that even given the reality of the resurrection, grief is an appropriate response to loss. It is okay to grieve, to struggle, and to feel loss. Jesus joins us at our darkest times. Sometimes it's hard to see him in those dark times. But he does. He's there with us always. And when the whole group arrived at the tomb, Jesus was asking those around him to say, trust me. He's saying the same thing to you and me today. But they wouldn't open the tomb without Martha's consent. I think this is important to realize. Martha had to say, it's okay to, you know, to open and roll away the stone. Would she act on the faith that she had in Jesus? Or would the grief and the disappointment of Jesus not turning up on time make her go, there's no point? But Martha's faith was still strong. She agreed. It says, so they opened the tomb and Jesus prayed. Not the sort of prayer that you would expect. Not the sort of words that you expect him to say. He approaches the tomb in complete confidence, knowing what he's about to do, knowing that it was the Father's will, and therefore knowing that the Father would provide the ability to do what he needed to do. And he simply asks and says thank you to God for hearing him. And he says, I've done this because I need others to see what's going on, to understand what's going on, for the sake of those listening. And again, we see this emphasis on faith. The purpose of Jesus' prayer was that those listening would believe that the Father had sent him. And Jesus calls to Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. And out comes Lazarus. He walks out of the town. He was bound hand and foot. I can imagine him like one of those mummies that, that you say wrapped around. Or as we do in youth groups sometimes, they wrap me in toilet roll just for a laugh. But it's hard to walk like that. But Lazarus did it. He was called to walk out of the tomb and he walked out. He comes to the mouth of the cave and the onlookers, <laughs> it's a, I think it's an understatement to say that they were awestruck. And Jesus had to prompt them and go, get him out of those clothes, those grave clothes. It only took three words from Jesus Lazarus, come forth. And he came back to life. He got up and he walked as best as he could to the front of that tomb. Three words. There is power in the name of Jesus. We sang about that at the start. There's power in the name of Jesus. I guess for the disciples standing there, I hope it did anyway. Their, their faith must have rocketed. None of them knew what was going to happen. They eventually trusted Jesus when all seemed lost, when all seemed pointless, when there was thought all they were doing was walking into danger. But my friends, the thing for us to remember this morning is it's never too late when it comes to the things of God and the things of Jesus. In the end, Jesus set everything right. He raised Lazarus from the dead. As I said earlier, Lazarus' family immediately forgot their grief and threw a feast. You see, Lazarus' death was not in vain because his rising brought a large number of people to faith in Jesus. That's, I think that's quite obvious. If you're there and you see this man walking who was dead and coming to life, you're going to say, wow. <laughs> wow, I need, need some of this, this, this God stuff. But in a few weeks later, Jesus really set everything 
right again in the world. Shouldering a heavy cross. He bore the sins of Lazarus, the sins of Lazarus' family, the sins of the world, the sins of you and me. As he readied himself to die, when once again he would defeat death and pay the price to set us free. For me, the important takeaway from our story of Jesus and Lazarus is the need to remember that God is never in a hurry. We may all be in a hurry to get things done. God isn't. God knows the perfect timing. Did you know, and as far, I think this is, yeah, I think this is true. I've sort of done a little bit of research. I've read a little bit. Did you know that there isn't an example of Jesus running anywhere in Scripture? You see, Jesus knew it was never too late to get to somewhere. It was never too late getting to Lazarus, even though he had already died. Jesus had a bigger plan in mind. A plan that would change the lives of so many people that witnessed what he did that day. He didn't want to heal Lazarus. He didn't want to heal Lazarus. He wanted to raise him from the dead. He wanted to show his power, the power of God. He wanted to do a miracle. And that's exactly what happened. Jesus walked up to the tomb, told Lazarus, come on on out. It's a bit like the price is right. It wasn't come on down. It was come on out. And Lazarus did. Sometimes you and I will face a situation that can get so bad that it makes us want to take matters into our own hands. Please, please don't do that. Instead, trust in God's perfect timing and expect a miracle. Expect a miracle. God is still doing miracles today. The Bible says, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, Romans 12 and verse 12. God already knows what's going on in our lives. He knows what's going on tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, the next decade. And we just need to trust that his timing is perfect. And his plan for your life is good and worth waiting for. Lazarus, if he was here, could vouch for that. Put all our trust in Jesus. He will never let you down. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you are a God who never gives us second best, always gives us the best. Thank you, Lord, that you care so much for us that you sent your son to die on a cross to set us free and to release us from sin and shame and death. Thank you, Lord, that you love each one of us, that you'll always turn up in your time, in the right time, Thank you that you continue to do miracles that we don't even recognize as miracles in our lives and the lives of those around us. Thank you that you are the same God. Now help us to trust in you. Let's stand as we sing our last song. Um, Not but hard to guess what the song is. It's called Trust in You.
So as we leave here today, let us leave trusting in him. But before you leave, could you have a seat and watch your screens as we play our final video. Thank you.